Good morning. I again would like to welcome you on behalf of the Arizona State Department of Education. I'm a Deputy Associate Superintendent within that organization, and I'd just like to thank you, John, for showing our statistics. <laughs> Some we can be proud of and others. Do you think we have a lot of work to do in Arizona? Yes. Yes, we do. It's my pleasure to be here, uh, really for the second time, greeting people to a, a Native American forum on dropout prevention being held here in Arizona. Uh, we're delighted to host, and if you all want to come back again, we would certainly welcome you with a mix of weather. Um, and this is a great time of year to do so. So thank you for traveling from great distances to do that. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce Superintendent Juno, Superintendent for the State Department of Education in Montana. And I was really pleased to see the work in Montana that's been done and done well as reflected in many of those statistics that Don shared with us. I asked Dr. Juno if there was any kind of special introduction this morning that she desired. Great. Because you all have your programs in front of you and you can kind of see uh, a little bit, but I, I certainly don't think any written description can truly describe the woman that she is and the accomplishments that she has made in her life. She is certainly somebody who has beaten the odds when you look at the statistics. Uh, she is a member of the Mandan and Hidatsa tribes of North Dakota. She grew up on the Blackfoot Reservation in Montana. And she's really kind of Montana raised and, and has stayed home to contribute uh, to her community and her state. She graduated from Browning High School. She did her undergraduate work at Monta Montana State University. She has a master's from Harvard Graduate School of Education. And she has a law degree from the University of Montana. Now, those in and of themselves create an amazing picture of this woman that you're about to hear from. But in 2008, she became the first American Indian woman elected to a statewide position. And that sets her far and above the crowd. So I introduce to you Superintendent Denise Juno. We are glad to have you. Thank you. That was awesome. Well, thanks. This is on. Hello, can you hear me with this? Well, I look around and I see a lot of uh, great people that I've worked with in the past, Deborah Norris and Carol from Nebraska, and tons of people. Well, I used to be the director of Indian education at the State Department of, um, at the Office of Public Instruction in Montana, and so it's great to see all of you again and be in the same room. I also see a lot of people from Montana, and it's always a pleasure to see great educators. I also want to thank Rachel for her prayer this morning. She's a Montana girl, just displaced here in Arizona for a while. Um, <laughs> My mom, Carol Juna, was the speaker here a couple years ago, I think, and so it's kind of fun to be a follow-up to my mother as well, who was a state senator and has been a longtime educator, and my parents actually have been involved in public education most of their lives, and so it's nice to be able to stand on their shoulders and be where I am. Um, and of course, Bill Mendoza and I'm so Quentin. glad you brought that up. I don't know if Bill's still here, but Wednesday. I know we're a little behind time. And he was just in Montana, actually, at the Montana Indian Education Association. And I had to follow him there. And he sucked up all the time there, too, so I don't know. Um, it's like if you give an Indian man a mic, you know, they'll take all the time. Um, I'm so glad you <laughs> And I guess I just want to again say hello to all the Montana educators in the room. It is really nice to see all of you. And I know this is a dropout prevention conference, and I'm going to start a little bit about um, one of our state's largest, what we're, what we're most proud of is, is a lot of um, things that are going on. I'm just going to give a small introduction to Montana. Um, we're the fourth largest state. Uh, we have 145,000, so over 145,000 square miles. I think the statistic is something like six people per square mile if we got all spread out. We're very, very rural. In fact, uh, we have what we call urban centers, but of course they're rural according to a lot of federal definitions as well. Our population is ranked 44th 
in the country, and we just hit one million people in our state. So <laughs> some people are ha happy with that, and some people are not. Um, I see, uh, you know, I was talking about our urban areas, and Billings is our largest so glad you uh, that up. city. Wow. And uh, they're kind of over there. My friend I grew up with, Clinton, and his Billings, sister Dulcie are both from there. And Dulcie runs the Indian Ed Department the for the Billings the School Indian District. Education. And I visited their area recently. My nephew goes to school in Billings Public Schools, and he's in fourth grade this year. And so I was there for the first day of school, and they were all going through the hallway. And I was like, you know, aren't you excited to be back in school? It's so exciting to have a new start. And, all the kindergartners were learning about how to operate on the playground, and the third graders were marching through the hallway being quiet, and this third grader did look up to me, and he was like, shh, we do not talk in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> I was also one time visiting Billings Public Schools and visited a middle school there, and it, you know, they have large schools for our, our state, and there was a vocabulary class going on in one of their English courses. And there was a, the teacher was standing up in front of the classroom and saying, you know, if you say a word 10 times, it will be yours for life. And so from way back in the room, you heard this little voice going, Amanda, 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 Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> and I also saw some Crow people here. Who's from Crow Reservation? All right, way back there. <laughs> And they, um, I was visiting Crow Agency School, which is a part of a Hardin district, but Crow Agency Public School one time, very cute little school. And I was walking around the fourth grade classroom and it was art class. And one of the, um, one of the little girls was drawing intently. And I looked down and I said, well, you know, what are you drawing? She goes, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. And I said, well, honey, you know, nobody look, knows what God looks like. And without even looking up, she said, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> And when we look at our state, we can see a lot of, you know, we have seven reservations in our state. We have one state recognized tribe, and these are those locations. And when we look across the state and we see our academic achievement, we look at our data, we know that there are areas of challenge. Our state actually does very well generally. We perform in the top five on national assessments in English, math, and science. We can only always count on our teachers doing a great job. And, you know, we look at educational outcomes and Montana is always a high performer. However, we do have areas of challenge. And when we see those, we really do take those challenges head on. Um, when we look across our state and we look at academic achievement, like many of your states, there would be a gap between American Indian students and white students. And when we dig down deeper and we look at where the struggling schools are, most of them are on our Indian reservations. And once we identify that, we can say, well, what are the components and what are the factors that are going on? And, you know, these are areas of, we found four factors of poverty. G deep, generational, concentrated, and isolated. And when you sit, have those four components of poverty anywhere in this country, whether it be inner city, whether it be reservations, you will find schools that struggle with academic achievement. And so that's where our work has begun its focus. I do want to just point out Montana is the only state in the country to have a constitutional obligation to provide Indian education for all. Very, very proud of this. This is what makes Montana very unique in how we approach education. We have a clause in our state constitution that says the state recognizes the distinct and unique cultural heritage of American Indians and is committed in its educational goals to the preservation of their cultural integrity. That's pretty powerful. Our, yeah. Our state rewrote its constitution in 1972. There were 100 delegates that came from across the state to rewrite it. They created very powerful educational provisions. One thing that's important to know is these 100 delegates that came together, there was not one Indian delegate amongst them. But Indian people came to the Constitutional Convention and advocated that their history and their voice be included in, in our legal document that binds us as citizens of our state. And they were able to convince the delegates to include this language and to pay respect to the First Nations who are within our borders. And so, you know, kudos to our state. It was a really great thing. And 
all of the things that we do in our state really springs from this constitutional language, so we're really fortunate. Of course, it took a while to get it implemented. We had, um, as I said, my mom was a state rep and a state senator for a while. And in 1999, she brought forward a bill that said, let's define what the legislative intent of the Indian Ed provision in our Constitution is, and came up with these three things, if I could see them. Um, one, that every Montanan be encouraged to learn about American Indians, that every staff be trained in American Indian history and culture and contemporary issues, and that when schools and our agency develop educational goals, that we work with tribes. And so this became the new law in 99. Of course, it took a while then to um, get implemented again. I'm going to walk down here for a minute. Just so I can make sure I'm on the right slide. <laughs> And then there was a lawsuit in 2004 because we didn't have money to do the work that we need to do to make sure that schools got implemented, the curriculum to make sure our state were able, was able to provide resources. So, and the strongest piece of that lawsuit was actually the Indian education provision. The state came back and said, or the, the court, our Supreme Court came back and said, the state has shown zero commitment to implementing the Indian education provision, zero and that in order to have a quality education, that they needed to make sure that Indian Education for All was being incorporated across all content areas, in every classroom, for every student in our state. Um, and so the legislature came back and met, and they developed a definition of a quality education. And it's a big laundry list of everything that schools need to be able to um, prove that they're doing, but within that laundry list, is Indian education for all. So now for any state, any school in our state to be saying they are offering a quality education, their content must be integrated with Indian education for all. Their staff must be trained in Indian, how to provide that content. And every student needs to be learning about the true, accurate, valid, authentic history of American Indians in this country and in our state and the contemporary issues that are going on. And so it's really fantastic when we see, you know, I always talk about our great hope is, our, is for those kindergartners who are entering our system, that it's too late for a lot of adults to learn how to deal with one another as human beings and instead of seeing prejudice and stereotypes and racism that goes on. But the true hope lies with those kindergartners and what they learn as they go along throughout the K-12 system when they graduate from high school and become our state, local, tribal, and national leaders, the types of knowledge they're going to have, the issues of sovereignty, the issues of dealing with uh, jurisdiction, having the knowledge of treaty rights, and that's what forms the basis of this country, and that those are still valid legal documents, is going to be phenomenal. And that's what's going to change the structure of our state and the st structure of this country. And so that is what, that's, you know, we're most proud of Indian education for all in our state, and our, We've been able to do great things. I was just at the Montana Indian Association where there was, we honored our governor, where he's been pushing this idea as well. And the state has provided over, since 2005, $58 million to the state and to schools to implement Indian Ed for All. So it's pretty significant. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, we are the only state in the country to actually integrate Indian Ed for All into our content standards and the new Common Core standards that all the states have adopted. And so when teachers are starting to implement Common Core in their classrooms, Indian Education for All is a part of that. And here's just a couple examples. So this is, I think, out of math. And just even including the words, including American Indian demographics, that that be a part of the learning. And in, I think that's English language arts, is that what it is? And then when they give the laundry list of examples that could be, putting American Indian policies, constitutions on the same par as the Federalist Papers and the US Constitution is pretty significant. And so that's what I'm saying, the type of learning, that's the knowledge that students will have when they graduate is pretty good stuff. And this is just a couple quotes you know, we've been doing it in full force just a few years, but this is from a 
white teacher in Big Fork, Montana, talking about the importance of Indian Ed for All to his classroom and the type of meaning it's had for him and his probably 98% non-Indian population sitting in his classroom. And then this is from an American Indian student uh, and just the meaning that it's had for him as well and the type of relevancy that it can provide for Indian students in the classroom. And you know, we talk a lot about sitting at the drum. Well, it's a lot of non-Indian students now coming to sit at the drum, but with respect and with honor and with dignity and being able to respect the tribal nations that they're sitting with. And that's really what it's meant to our state. So I'm going to speak, which one's that? Um, just a little bit more, so education in Montana, uh, like I said, we have great public schools. We have about 821 public schools. We have over 420 districts in our state uh, with a, that serve about 142,000 students. Um, and every year, even though we have that population, about 2,000 students drop out of school across our state. So we knew that was a significant challenge that we had to address. And when we look at the data, American Indian students drop out of school at three times the rate of white students. And that is not acceptable either. So I'm going to cover two topics very quickly. Um, Graduation Matters Montana and Montana Schools of Promise. Graduation Matters Montana. This has three objectives. It really is to increase the rate of Montana students graduating from high school, being ready for college and careers, establish a support network from the community level uh, with schools, businesses, and um, make sure that th all those stakeholders who are, bring are coming together are inspiring students to stay in school. We know we need the community. You know, we talk a lot about public schools. The, you know, we work with public schools primarily. We don't have charter schools in our state. We don't have vouchers. Um, and we believe in public education. That is the last great public venture that goes on in this country, and we will support it. It's open to all, to every student that walks up to the schoolhouse door. That's what the greatness of public education is, and that's why we support it. Um, but we also need to support public schools in that effort as well. That um, because it's public, that the community needs to be involved in making sure they're supporting students as well. As I said, when we look at data, American Indian students disproportionately drop out of school. And when we look at our urban areas, they, are, uh, they, they, they have a higher rate of Native American dropouts. And a lot of that is because even though they may be rural, according to the federal government, they're our biggest schools. And a lot of times, um, they can fall through the cracks. And we only have two BIE schools in our state as well. The rest are all public, that state public that serve American Indian students. And actually, if we took our BIE schools and put them into the mix, they are the lowest performing schools in our state. We had some legislative priorities around it. Um, raise the legal dropout age from 16 to 18. A lot of our tribes also already have codes that say student, their tribal students need to stay in school until 18. This did not pass in our last legislative session, but we'll be taking it back to them. We had a bill to establish minimal anti-bullying policies. We're one of two states now in the country to not have that law, although our schools actually do a pretty good job of having policies that are comprehensive. We just want to make sure that every school has that. And we had a budget request to pay for the ACT for every junior in the state. That also failed, but our gear up grant is now going to pay for the ACT for every junior, so we'll be able to measure college readiness of all of the students. So because our uh, legislative agenda did not make it, we started hitting the road and going around to different communities involving businesses and nonprofits and community-based organizations, school districts, teachers, students, and bringing all the stakeholders together to talk about what can communities do? What can your community do to keep more students in school? And so what's great about Graduation Matters is every community looks different, their plans look different, but it's a statewide initiative because they are the ones who have to decide how it looks. Right now, 65% of Montana students are attending a school where there is a um, 
Graduation Matters initiative going on in their, in their community. We have business partners. We are share, our job at the state level is to share what works across different communities. And these are just a few pictures of some of those meetings. This one was uh, the Hardin launch I was just recently at. Hardin is a school that's right off the Crow Reservation. Their makeup is 70% American Indian students now, primarily Crow. Um, they were a recipient of, a, we got a big $450,000 grant from a, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation and were able to seed some local efforts that are going on and Hardin was one of the recipients of that. And so they had great student involvement. They had students doing PSAs, talking on their local radio. Uh, they came up with themes. One of their themes I thought was really great was the, the tassel is worth the hassle. That's good stuff. But if you want more info on that, this is our website, graduationmattersmontana.mt.gov. We have community toolkits, we have one pagers, we have lots and lots of information on that website. So please check it out. One thing I've done since being in office is start a student advisory group, a student advisory board to provide student voice at the state level. Phenomenal group of students, about 40 students from 30 different communities coming together. Um, some are valedictorians of their class, some are students who have dropped out of school and dropped back in, so they bring a very diverse perspective. We've been able to talk with them about a lot of tough issues, school climate, bullying that goes on in school, dropout prevention. Um, and the three main things they come up with, and it's probably no surprise, the structure. They want structure in their school. They want to know the rules, they want to be clear about the rules, and they want those rules applied fairly and equally. Relevance, again going back to Indian Ed for All, they want learning that relates to their lives and who they are, and they want support. And I know all the research goes back to support of having one caring adult care about them and support them through school. And, um, and so that's pretty significant. As like, if that's all it is to keep students in school, one caring adult, we should be able to figure that out. And then they came up with this idea of I pledge to graduate where they, they said, you know, we're sitting around talking about what adults can do, well, what can students do? Students can take a pledge to graduate. So they fill out this card, they say I pledge to graduate, they add a because statement, and then they have a significant person sign it, to witness it, to support them, keep, support keeping them in school. Um, this actually was an idea that came from the Student Advisory Board. We have over 2,500 students across our state who have taken the pledge. We have an online pledge site for them. And then every month we do a, week, a monthly drawing so uh, for iPod or gas cards or something that they can do. And we just did a pledge at the Montana Indian Ed Association where all the students who attended the conference pledged to graduate. Dulcie over there, Billings School District, actually at the beginning of the year had the first, very first pledge event and they did it with their American Indian students when they were there for their pre-session going for, for the freshmen learning about the high school. And I'm just going to run through these really fast as well. Montana schools of promise. When I first got elected, we looked across the state and again at data and saw where some of the schools were struggling. And I'm from these communities, so I you know, have a very special fondness for wanting to make sure that we're supporting schools to make learning better. And so I started the administration, we started an initiative called Schools of Promise. And it really was to support those schools who are struggling with academic achievement and dropout rates. And, you know, with making sure their students are um, leaving school with the skills they need. And so we traveled around a lot and did a lot of community visits. We identified certain school districts we wanted to work with. And then, a year later, came the school improvement grant money in a significant amount. Uh, it was built up because of the Recovery Act. So coming from the federal government, our state received $11.5 million. We usually receive a million and a half. And usually the way it works is the school improvement grant money comes in, we identify the schools that we have to under the federal guidelines, and we say, write us a grant, here's your money, good luck with your reform. But because it was such a significant amount of money, we said let's approach this differently and let's identify the school districts and let's offer them an opportunity to enter into partnership with us. Unprecedented for Montana. Um, so we have a very unique model that has come out of this. 
And it really is about collaboration to build capacity and support. These were the schools. This is how they got in was by, we had to run all the state test scores, um, the proficiency rates, and these schools were very low performing. So, and we knew that when we looked at this data, we had to increase literacy so we could build the future of Indian country. And in order to build communities, you need to have literate community members. Um, all schools on reservations. And that was pretty tough to take. And I know it was really tough for those communities as well who got identified. These were their graduation rates. Uh, four years on time is how the federal government defines it, the AYP rate. And then when we traveled around, you know, we always have to remember that behind every data point is a child. And that's what our work really focuses on, is making sure that we're seeing these faces, and it's not just about numbers, but it's about the kids and those communities, and that's really how we want to approach it, is making sure it's as student-centered as possible, and that we keep focused on these faces. When we looked at the schools, you know, I talked about the four factors of deep generational isolated and concentrated poverty. And so we looked at what are some of the factors that we need to consider in our approach, and these were some of the things that we came up with. And then we found this model out of Boston, out of Mass Insight, around high-performing, high-poverty schools, three elements of readiness, readiness to, act, readiness to teach, readiness to learn, readiness to act. And state agencies, state education agencies, usually spend about 90% of our energy on readiness to teach. Curriculum and standards, assessment, data, looking at all those issues. And so we had to really look at how does our agency approach this, and how do we then approach this model with schools? So we structured our model and our staff on this model. Uh, we had a unique population that we had to address. It needed state-level coordination a collaborative process, and like I said, we entered into agreements with the schools who wanted to participate in the school improvement grant. We were able to get approved where the money just didn't flow out to schools. They had to enter into this partnership agreement with us. Um, we have been working on the ground. We have uh, Donnie Wetzel right here is one of our SIG member staffs at the state level. I'm going to wave around, so if you have questions in the future, you can ask that guy. Um, and we developed a very unique model. And we are learning a lot about ourselves, about our state, and about our schools. And when we are figuring out when adults work together, when adults get it together and work together, that great things can happen. One of our schools was slotted in one of our state papers for welcoming the hard changes. And there was a school board member quote, quoted in it that said, I saw it coming. Thank God it came. It was a relief to know our children are going to get caught up and won't fall behind. And that was speaking about the partnership that we have with them. This was the model we created. It looks sort of uh, like a lot, but it's not really. And we have, this is, these are all state level people who are working on the ground with these schools. We have a community liaison who works with communication between the school and community based organizations and tribes. Uh, we have a school board coach who works with school boards on governance issues and keeping their eyes focused on academic achievement, financial issues, and all the things that they need to govern around. We have a transformation leader working with the leadership in the school, and we have instructional coaches working with teachers. And so it's a full court press um, on school improvement. You know, we walk, I went around, that we spent lots of time in these schools, and I travel to these schools all the time, and a lot of hard work and focus at the state level and local level um, just because it's important to show support for the work they're doing. So we visited with tribal councils, tribal education departments, some of the Head Start. I like that little Head Start picture. That guy's kind of mad in the back there. <laughs> Did not want his picture taken. Um, we held community meetings, and these communities are very small, and hundreds of people turned out. And we were truthful about their data, and we said, here's your data. You've been identified as one of the lowest performing schools in the state. And we had hard, hard discussions with them. We visited tribal colleges. And we've learned a lot of lessons through our, school, our Schools of Promise initiative that there can be no fly-by-night services. You know, our state's so rural, we don't get SES providers clamoring in our state. 
And so a lot of this work is done between our staff and the staff on the ground. Um, we've had our, the staff in our three, three schools we're now with over 100 home visits. And home visits where teachers go to their students' homes not to say your student needs to get better and not to talk about school at all. They just sit down with the parent and say, tell me your hopes and dreams for your child. And that's how they start the conversation. There are wellness programs up on the Fort Peck Reservation where there are student nurses in the school now providing on-site physical um, health issues. Um, we have, we've learned that our agency can be nimble and we can be flexible when we need to. We know that community stakeholders and tribal ed departments are key contacts for our local staff. In fact, some of our tribal ed departments use their email distribution service to help us communicate out to their tribal members. Um, we have tribal college honor students mentoring high school students. We have tribal college students offering after school film classes. And we know now that everything has to come together. Every adult has to work together and stakeholders have to own it. You know, when we started this initiative, I traveled out to those communities and tell them, you know, I, I understand these issues, but I get to go home to Helena tonight. That's what I get to do. And go to my townhouse, watch TV, and you are the ones who have to take care of your children on the ground. You are the ones who have to come together and work as a community to make sure your students are learning and that your communities get better. We are now looking for ways to solidify this model and the lessons learned so that when there's a change in leadership at the school level, as so often happens, that does not mean a change in direction. And we need to equip local community leaders to expect new school leaders to continue the work. And the great news is, after year one, every one of our school improvement grant schools saw increases in their math, reading, and science scores. And I'm not just talking a mere improvement, I'm talking significant change. That top line is the state trajectory, so an improvement of maybe 1%. And those schools on the bottom are our SIG schools. And the amount of double-digit increases in what was going on. And then this is math, also very significant math increases. And so then I get to go back to the community and the school boards and communicate this good news. And they had big community celebrations and the tribe helped them with their feeds and brought things together and those communities celebrated that they are focused on academic achievement. One of our schools made AYP for the first time in 10 years. Huge growth. Their graduation rates, most of them increased over time. Um, in fact, Fraser is at the school on our Fort Peck reservation who saw the most significant growth. Um, they are now have the highest graduation rate on the entire Fort Peck Reservation of all the schools in one year. We had a community meeting there recently and the tribal health director was there and he said, you know, I thought it would take a generation for change to occur. He said, but when we see promising um, things like this go on that we know it's possible. We've received national, regional, and local attention. You know, the Atlantic wrote about prior schools and the type of violence that goes on in that community, but how there's hope at the end of the road, and that hope comes through education. Um, we had the U.S. Department of Education come in and do an audit of our school improvement grant. We are the only state in the country to have zero findings that they th thought we were a model for the country as far as rural and reservation schools. Um, so we are building a national model for improving high poverty, low performing schools in rural areas and primarily on Indian reservations. We're proud, I'm very, very proud of the work that our staff does and the incredible dedication of local teachers, um, families, and students. And, you know, we, when I first entered office, we had a visit from Secretary Duncan. I was going to show a video, but we won't get to it. But what he says in this video is he talks about, so I got to go to Lame Deer, which is on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Frank's here. He's the, um, one of the principals at the high school there in one of our SIG schools. And so he went out there with the Secretary from, of Housing as well, and so they were visiting and tell this story about, <laughs> it's w really rural. And so they pull up and we're waiting for him out there. There's this big um, metal teepee in this outside town called Busby. And they pulled up and their black SUVs come screeching into the gravel and jumped out 
and went out to the road to look around and nobody coming for miles. And they all pulled out their blackberries, no service. So I think it was a rough, couple, a rough day for a couple of federal officials out there when they couldn't communicate with anybody. Um, but he came back and he went to this press club event. He was talking about his visit and it was the first time he'd ever visited an Indian reservation. And, but he talked about how the students that he met there were just as brilliant and just as talented and just as capable as any student he meets from across this country. I was there at the meeting when he had this meeting with community members and students were there and there was a student there named Teton Magpie. And talk about speaking truth to power, this kid gets up and says, you know, Mr. Secretary, all I want is for me to come to school and be challenged and be supported and to know that when I graduate, I'm going to be prepared. That was it. Um, and Secretary Duncan said it's not, it's not the students, it's just that the systems around them are failing. And then he closes by saying he will have personally failed if our schools on these reservations do not improve and students do not find success. And I always like to close with this video because I think it's so powerful, but it's also my accountability to Secretary Duncan. Here were your words. And now it's your obligation to make sure you live up to your promise. Bill Mendoza. <laughs> and I think this is, you know, hold your leaders accountable. Hold your state education agency accountable to performing well for your students, for caring about them, and for doing the right thing. Just like I'm going to hold Secretary Duncan accountable as well. Um, you know, I appreciate all your good work you do. We do know that education is the only way we're going to improve our communities and have a bright economic future and make sure that we're successful as Indian people as we move out into the state and across the country. And so I appreciate all of your work that you do in your respective states and your respective agencies and your respective schools. It's so important. In fact, there's no more important work that can be done than the education of our youth. So thank you very much. Thank you.